Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the flood came, the winds beat against that house, but it did not collapse because its foundation had been laid on rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds beat against that house, and it collapsed. It was utterly destroyed. So I want to start this evening with a little bit of crowd participation, okay? So if something is true of you when I say it, I just want you to quietly stand to your feet. Because what Jesus is saying here is, listen, if you hear my words and put them into obedience... If you do the things that I've said, then you have a firm foundation, you've got a rock, your house is going to stand when the storms come. But if you don't, well, then you're on sand, and it's going to be destroyed, right? So I just want to check in at the very beginning here to see how we're doing when it comes to hearing the words of the Lord and putting it into practice. Does that sound good? Okay, so I want you to stand up. If you have ever told a lie, <laughs> sit back down. I want you to stand up if you've ever eaten shellfish, shrimp, lobster, mussels, oysters. Okay, sit down. I want you to stand up if you've ever, tonight or at any other time, worn a garment made of both wool and linen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sit down. Okay, I want you to stand up. If at any point in your life, you have been jealous of another to the point that you wish you had their life instead of yours. Okay, sit back down. Last one. Last one. I want you to stand up if you've ever, in your anger, been destructive to the point that you have hurt yourself or someone else. All right, sit back down. Let me read this again. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the flood came, the winds beat against that house, and it collapsed. It was utterly destroyed. Just based off of this small little survey, mind you, there's 613 of these laws and words of God that he's given us, right? Just based off of this, it feels like we might be in a little bit of trouble. Anyone? Yeah. Right? A little bit like, so then what? Right? Like maybe I've heard some of these things and I know I shouldn't. But we all know that we all struggle, we all fall short, we've all sinned, so then where does that leave us? Because this is saying, if I've heard his words and I do not do what they say, I'm building on sand. And I'm going to be destroyed when the, sand, when the storms come. So then is our only option to do exactly what he says all of the time? Is that our only hope? I'm not so sure, because right before this passage, Jesus says this in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many powerful deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you, Go away from me, you lawbreakers. Wait, well, what? So here we have people 
who are literally doing the things that God has told them to do. They're putting into practice the words that he's given them. They're prophesying. They're casting out demons. They're doing the things of the kingdom. And Jesus says, I'm going to tell him, get away from me. I never knew you. And then we just confess to one another that over and over again, God tells us to do things and we don't do them. So what hope do we have? What's actually happening in this passage? What is Jesus trying to teach us? How do we build our life on a firm foundation? If we know that even in our best efforts, we are going to mess up, how do we make sure that when the storms of life come, we will not be destroyed? Earlier this morning, Chad was talking about the kingdom. And he was talking about how this kingdom is of great worth and great value, right? And he also mentioned that every kingdom has a king. And it's my belief that what this verse, these verses are telling us this evening is if you want to have a firm foundation, then you have to have a right understanding of who the king is who's asking you to do things. You have to have a right understanding of who the king is who rules this kingdom that can become a firm foundation in your life. But how do we do that? Because Jesus comes to these people earlier and he's like, get away from me, I never knew you. We were never in a relationship. You may have been doing all the right things, but you didn't know me. I didn't know you. So what does it mean to know the one true king, the one true God of this kingdom so that when the storms come and they will come, they've already come and they keep coming, we don't get destroyed. Because my, my belief is the reason why some of you guys are still searching, even though you've heard the words of the Lord, is because the view or picture of God that you have is inaccurate. It's not big enough. It's not the fullness of who he actually is. For some of you, the picture of God that you have is this very distant God. This God who exists somewhere, I guess up in the clouds, right? But he's not concerned or involved in my day to day. And you've gotten to this conclusion because maybe you've prayed some prayers that have gone unanswered. You've asked God for specific things and they have not come to fruition. You look at the state of the world today and you're like, where is God? What's he doing? How, how is all of this happening? Does he not care? Is he just some distant God that actually doesn't matter? Does he even know my name? Does he even know my pain? Does he understand my circumstances, the things that I'm going through? Because when I try to connect with him, he feels so far away. And if he wasn't distant, right? If God was present, then surely the world would look different. Surely he'd fix some of the issues and problems that we see. Surely we wouldn't see some of the major issues happening in the world now happening in the church. People being hurt and wounded in the church. Like, God, if you cared, wouldn't you be involved? And for some of you, I think you've just settled there. You acknowledge that there's a God, but for you, he's distant and so when it comes to, like, hearing his voice and doing what he says, like, why? What's the point, right? I mean, if he's not going to listen to you, if he's not going to show up for you, then why, why bother? Some of you, that's your view of God. 
And that kind of God cannot sustain you through a storm. For some of you, your God's not distant. The picture of God that you have is one that is incredibly critical, constantly letting you know how much you're disappointing him, how much you're letting him down, that when you mess up, which you're bound to do, the picture of God that you have is one who is just arms crossed, shaking his head, looking at you with utter disappointment. Like, get your act together, kid. Right? Like, we think he's so critical, just constantly wanting us to be perfect, and we're not, and we can never measure up. His voice in our head is mean. It's not kind. It's constantly feeling like he's berating us. Like, just do better. Try harder. What's wrong with you? You can do this. And you can know if you have this picture of God simply by how you read scripture and hear God's voice back to you. Let me give you an example. We know the story, most of us, of the disciples being in the boat on the water. And the storm comes and all of a sudden, Jesus miraculously is walking on the water. And Peter All the other disciples are kind of freaking out. They're like, it's a ghost because it's weird. Like people don't walk on water, right? That's like not really a thing. But here's this person walking on water. And Peter is like, Lord, if that's you, like call me out. Like I'm coming. I'll I'll try to walk too. That sounds cool, right? And he does. And Jesus calls him out. And Peter starts to walk on the water towards Jesus. But then all of a sudden he begins to sink. And they get back in the boat. And after that, Jesus says to Peter, ye of little faith, what happened? What happened to your faith, right? How you read that and understand that is a clue to who you think this God is. You can read that with Jesus having utter disappointment in Peter for lacking faith and taking his eyes off of him and focusing on the storm around. Like, dude, what happened? Where's your faith? Haven't I taught you enough? Shouldn't you know by now that I'm here for you? What's wrong with you, Peter? And some of you read it like that. But maybe instead, God is a little bit more like getting Peter back in the boat and doing a little pep talk like, hey man, you're the only one who got out of the boat. First of all, awesome, well done. Second of all, talk to me. What happened? You had it. What happened? Do you see the difference? How we read scripture, how we hear Jesus' voice in our ears matters. Because if your picture of God is that he is just utterly critical, always looking for how you're messing up, how you're falling short, I promise you, eventually, It's not going to work for you. Eventually, you're going to get tired of trying to follow a God like that. And you're going to stop. You're going to stop trying to put his words into action because you're going to convince yourself, I'm not going to do it anyway. I'm not good enough. So why bother? And a critical God is not a God who is worthy of a firm foundation. He's not a God who can get you through the storms of this life. Or maybe, for some of you, God's not critical. He's just really hard to please. And you're doing everything in your power to earn his love. And if I'm honest, when I first became a Christian, this was my concept of God. I wasn't raised in the church. I started going to a youth group when I was a freshman in high school. And it was there that I did learn for the first time that there was a God who loved me. But the gospel as I understood it made it seem like God was really hard to please. 
And I came to that conclusion because when Jesus is hanging on the cross, right, at the end of his life on earth, the end of his ministry, dying on behalf of all of us for our sins, he says the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I look at that and I'm like, if, if God, the father, is forsaking his son, who like did everything right, but can't have anything to do with him in this moment, then what hope do I have? Right? Like, what hope do I have that God would love me? How am I sure that I'm not going to fall out of his good grace and his love? How do I make sure that I'm good enough that he doesn't turn his back on me? That was my big concern as a high school student. And so my response was, I'm just going to do everything I can in the name of the Lord. I'm just gonna be at church as much as I can. I'm gonna be as zealous for the Lord as I possibly can. I'm gonna tell all of my friends about Jesus, and these were good things. But if I'm honest, they were motivated by a fear that maybe, maybe I wasn't good enough. Maybe God couldn't fully accept me. And I had a reason to fear that. Because at that time in my life, I wasn't fully accepted in my family. It was pretty dysfunctional. It was pretty messed up. And I was kind of the outcast in my family. I kind of caught a lot of flack for everything <laughs> that went on. And I was reminded often how much of a burden I was, how much of a pain I was, how, why can't I just get it right? Why can't I just fall in line? Why do I have to be so hard? And so it was really easy for me to take that experience and put it on top of Jesus and think he's probably the same way. And so why don't I try just really, 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 really hard and do all of the right things? But as we just showed this evening, that's impossible because I still failed. I still messed up. And that kind of God, while it might serve you well for a while, that one also will not sustain you when the storms of life come. That type of God is not a firm foundation and it is not the gospel. It's not the God that we read about in scripture. And so I want to introduce you, maybe some of you for the first time, and maybe for the first time even to some of you who have grown up in church, of who the God of Scripture actually is, who this king of this kingdom truly is, what he's like, and what he has to offer you. You see, I was always under the impression that God could have nothing to do with our sin because he was too holy, right? And that there was this major divide that was created, and thankfully Jesus comes and he restores that divide. And yet, when I look at Genesis, when sin first enters into our story, God does not separate himself from Adam and Eve, he enters into the garden and he seeks them out. That's who our God is. He doesn't separate himself from us in our mess, in our filth. He pursues us and he continues to do so. Yes, there are natural consequences to our sin. And as a result, they left the garden. But God never stopped pursuing his people. God never stopped doing whatever he could, whatever was possible to get as close to his people as he could. And so in the desert, when the Israelites are walking around and trying to figure out their way, God set up a tabernacle to be amongst them. 
even in their groaning and moaning and complaining, even in their building of the gold calf and their idols and their trying to worship of other gods, God is physically present amongst them. He is leading them with a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. He is present to them. And then the temple gets built, this actual space where his presence dwells within the holy of holies, that there is a place where people can go and be with him. And that wasn't enough. It wasn't close enough. And so he comes in the form of Jesus to be with us to show us what life is like, what life is all about, how to live this life out. And even that wasn't close enough. Jesus dies on the cross. Jesus raises from the dead. Jesus ascends back into heaven, and God gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. His presence now inside of us like I don't know if you guys get how big of a deal that is like some of you you may have thought like man when I when I get to heaven I can't wait to talk to Moses right and I can't wait to ask him about how he split the Red Sea and what that was like and were there like fish on either side or whatever I don't know and For some of you, it's like, I want to talk to David. I want to know what it was like when he took Goliath down. And maybe we'll have time to hear those stories. But can I tell you what I think is going to happen? I think David, I think Moses, I think all of those guys are going to come running up to you and ask you, what was it like to have God inside of you? What was that like? What was it like to have the very presence of God living inside of you, leading and guiding you, having constant 100% access to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Holy of Holies inside of you? God always looks like Jesus. God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell within Jesus. So when we look at Jesus and how he interacted with people who sinned, with people who messed up, what do we see? We don't see him turning his back. We don't see him running away. We see him engaging and reminding people over and over again, this is who you are. You are loved Not because of what you do or how you performed. You're loved because your identity is a child of God. You are accepted. Not on any merit of your own. You're accepted because your identity is a child of God. You are good. I see you as good. This, this is who our king is. He is not a distant king. He's not a critical king. He is not a hard to please king. He comes to you first and declares you are holy. You are good. You are loved. You are worthy. You are accepted. That is the starting point with this king. There is no trying to get on the right page with him. You already have it. And this king and this king alone is the only one worthy of you giving up everything and building your life on this rock, this foundation. Because the storms will come. And this God, this Jesus, will meet you in the midst of them. I know. Because I've had quite a few storms in my life. Some of you guys have seen me walking around campus with my three kids. I have three boys. My twins are four. My youngest is one and a half. What you can't see from the outside looking in 
is the journey that I've been on to have those children. You see, when my husband and I first started trying to have kids, we couldn't. We dealt with infertility for a number of years. Had multiple surgeries, multiple fertility treatments, multiple times crying out to God, asking him to grant me the gift of being a mother. And in the midst of all that, we had a miscarriage. We lost a baby. And then on our last fertility treatment, we were blessed to get pregnant with our twin boys. And it was amazing. Until it wasn't. At seven weeks, I developed what was called hyperemesis, which is extreme morning sickness, which means you literally just throw up all day, every day, until you have the babies. So for 37 weeks, that was my life. And I cried more tears on the other side of an answered prayer than I had ever cried waiting for that prayer to be answered. And I asked more questions about God, wondering why. Why can't any of this just be easy? Why is all of this so hard? Why am I so sick? And then we delivered two healthy babies, and we thought we were done and we were good, but through a number of things that happened, felt like the Lord wanted us to be obedient, to open our hands and ask him if we were done having kids. And I was like, no, thank you. I'm not going to ask that because I don't want to know your answer, God. But because I know who he is, because I know that he's good and that he's for me and not against me, I said, have your way, God. And immediately we were pregnant, something we were never able to do on our own. Immediately we were pregnant. And a few weeks after that, we lost the baby. A couple months go by, we get pregnant again. I'm like, all of a sudden, my body just wants to get pregnant all the time. And then we lost that baby. And then I got mad. <laughs> Like, I don't understand, right? It just felt like we were in a constant storm, constant space of disappointment and let down and frustration. And why, God? I didn't even want another kid. And now I'm at a point where I've lost three. And now I want one, right? Now I'm like, yes, please, I want to be a mother again. It's great. And thankfully, we got pregnant again, and we have our baby boy. But with that pregnancy came another nine months of hyperemesis in and out of the hospital, so sick. And what I can tell you is that in all of that, Jesus has been there. That even in the midst of my doubt and my anger and my frustration and my crying out and my why, God, why, he was there, loving me, being with me. And soon after we had Cascade, I just had this sense, because I might be a glutton for punishment, I don't know, but I'm like, I don't think our family's done. I think we're supposed to have another one. It took my husband a little bit to get on board with that one, but he did. And last December, we found out we were pregnant right before we were moving here to Johnson. And again, I start with the sickness. We go, we see the heartbeat, everything's good. And a couple weeks later, we lose the baby. And at this point, <laughs> it just feels really unfair, right? To be in this reality of knowing that I have more babies in heaven than I do in my arms. And asking why. 
But Jesus has been good. And he's still worth it. He's still worth it. And eight weeks ago, we found out we were pregnant. And so I'm right back in that place of throwing up all day, every day, hoping, praying that this little baby will survive and that our family will be complete. Here's what I know. I'm not promised that. Right? Right? But what I know is that my feet are on a firm foundation. And that whatever happens, whether we welcome this baby into our family in January, or whether we grieve yet another loss, whatever happens, he is still good. He is still for me. He is still with me. I don't know what your storms look like. I'm guessing they're not the same. But I'm guessing you also can relate. Feeling beat down over and over and over again and getting to a point where you're asking why and you're questioning and you're angry. And all I can tell you is that this king this Jesus, not a distant one, not a critical one, not a hard to please one, but a loving one who did everything he possibly could to pursue you, to come after you, to be with you, that he is enough to get you through whatever storm you are facing. And the more you come to know this king, the easier it actually gets to say yes to hear his words and to put them into practice because you know at the core of who you are that he is for you and his words are meant to bless you and to protect you and to lead you and to guide you and to grow you and to develop you into everything that he's created for you to be. You wanna withstand the storms of your life you want to be on a rock instead of shifting sands? Get to know the real king. Because he and he alone will sustain you. He's for you. He loves you. He accepts you. He calls you good. Let's pray.